Right, and next up, well, we have been talking, we have been staying on the ground so far, haven't we? Talking about even self-driving vehicles, but on the ground. Now let's elevate our heights slightly higher, moving into air mobility. Next up, we have with us Michael Savanka, CEO of Vertical Aerospace, to talk to us about flying vehicles. Welcome, Michael. Thank you very much. And I think we're just going to start with a little short video. So that was VA1X. Well, why don't you yeah. walk us through what we just saw as well as what Vertical Aerospace is working on at the moment? Um, so perhaps just give a bit of background on Vertical. We've actually been going for about five years. So we're one of the oldest eVTOL companies out there. We were um, originally spun out of a Formula One team as a special projects activity founded by Stephen Fitzpatrick, who's a successful British entrepreneur. Um, we've flown two full-scale prototypes so far, but the vehicle you've just seen is the vehicle that we intend to take to market. Um, I'm sure we can get into lots more discussions around it, but fundamentally it's an electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, which means it's fully battery powered, zero emissions. It can take off and land from a traditional heliport. Uh, it can fly at up to 200 miles an hour and ranges up to about 100 miles. Um, and it does so at a fraction of the noise, so about 100 times quieter in cruise, 30 times quieter in hover than a helicopter, about a quarter of the operating cost and 100 times safer. So we really believe that this is the highest value opportunity for electric aviation near term, and it's really going to disrupt the way we travel. And you mentioned earlier the EV, F, EV toll, yes. <laughs> and you're going to be the first to be certified on course to certify in 2024. Yeah, th th there's a bit of a space race going on in this uh, arena at the moment, but I think we we feel that we've got really credible partners, so partners like Honeywell and Solvay, in fact, another one to be announced today. Um, and with that deep aerospace expertise, combined with the pace and agility of a startup and all the F1 mentality, um, I think we're in, in a really good place to be certainly one of, if not the first certified vehicles of this kind of capability globally. Uh, it, well, and of course, earlier on, we already had tr perhaps some challenges getting people to accept self-driving vehicles being grounded. Now, of course, VA1X comes with a pilot at its current stage, but people are still a bit concerned. You know, recently we heard about Kobe Bryant and the pilot crash. Mm -hmm. uh, people still have that perception that flying in small aircraft tends to be a little more unsafe, regardless of how much faster or quieter it is. What would you say to people that have key safety concerns? So, so I think the first thing we very deliberately set out with the view that the public and the regulators are not going to accept these vehicles to be autonomous or unpiloted for quite a long time. In fact, we don't expect that this decade. Um, and we very much built our aircraft around safety and around the regulations. Um, so the Honeywell flight control system, in fact, makes the vehicle incredibly easy to fly. A helicopter, if you've ever tried to fly one, I've been in a simulator, it's really hard. Uh, and helicopters, have, although they're incredible machines, got some, some fundamental challenges that can cause safety issues. And so they have a, a very heavily stressed, complicated mechanical drive system that is what's called a single point failure. So if you lose any component in that drive system, the aircraft is unable to maintain continuous flight. The real advantage of electrification is that we're able to bring in redundancy. So what that means, we've got multiple batteries, we've got multiple motors, multiple lift rotors, multiple flight control systems. And so if we have any individual component failure, the aircraft can maintain safe level flight. Uh, and in fact, the flight control system takes care of everything. The pilot doesn't need to react, doesn't need to do anything. He's just telling the aircraft where to go, not how. 
I think in terms of safety levels, you're, you're right that traditionally small aircraft have been certified to safety levels less than we've got used to in big commercial airliners. Um, in fact, in the eVTOL space right now, there is a difference between the regulations the FAA is setting out, so the American Aviation um, uh, Federal Aviation Authority, uh, and EASA, which is the European equivalent, and the CAA, the UK equivalent. We very deliberately decided to go for the EASA and CA regulations. They're 100 times safer than the FAA, and they are the same safety levels that we've all rightly come to expect for commercial airliners. And, and our view, and I think, you know, we're seeing Singapore doing concurrent validation with the ASA and other countries I think will follow suit is these, these vehicles with all those benefits I talked about can really become the new ultra short haul airliner and can really change the way we move around. But if they're, if they're to achieve that, clearly they're going to end up in large numbers. Um, and so we have to have the very higher safety standards because otherwise immediately the whole opportunity in the whole industry will, will be terminated. Absolutely. And I think for sure safety is, is the paramount concern here. And it's great to hear that you're working to work eliminate single point failure, working in redundancy. Now, of course, the question on people's minds is costs. You know, all these safety measures and all these new technological advancements, is it going to result in something that's out of reach for the masses? So, so we very deliberately set up the company not aim of developing a cool aircraft that billionaires can fly in. Um, the, the real opportunity is um, to, to drastically reduce the cost of flying versus a helicopter. Helicopters are just not a mass transport mode. They're too expensive. Mm -hmm. About a third of the operating cost in a helicopter is maintenance, and that's driven by those complex mechanical systems. It's driven by the fact we have to do regular inspections because of the safety issues. Um, so electrification actually enables us to have a uh, vehicle where most of the components will be fit and forget. Um, we do, of course, have batteries that we have to contend with, so we will be swapping the batteries. There are lots of second, third life use cases for those batteries on ground um, grid storage and the like. Um, so, so that's kind of an offset. But in, in the other benefits we get is the vehicle itself is far more efficient than a, a, a helicopter. It's using that wing to give it very efficient, fast cruise. Um, and uh, we can get much higher utilization. So helicopters today typically don't fly many hours a year, and therefore the cost per hour is very high. So all of these things combined get us down to cost per passenger mile of less than $4, less than $3 quite quickly. And so you can start to see actually this is comparable to an Uber, um, but instead of taking, you know, an hour or two hours to get somewhere across a city or to a region, then suddenly you can do it in a, in a matter of minutes. So I think this is why we're seeing uh, lots of consultancies, most recently Morgan Stanley issuing reports with enormous addressable markets because this potential to really change the way people travel around and do it at a level that is absolutely affordable for a wide um, proportion of the population. So I think the part that everybody's latching on to is that its price is going to be comparable to taking an Uber, except in a fraction of the time. When is that yeah. future going to approach us? When is that going to be feasible? So, so for us, our aim is that we certify in late 2024 and we start operations in 2025. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can get down to those costs very quickly. So we're not relying on autonomous vehicles. We're not relying on some new wonder battery coming out. Um, Really, we just need to be starting to produce the aircraft in reasonable numbers, and we will roll up quite quickly. Um, and then for them to be operated, um, you know, with a high utilization rate. So, so the more we can use these aircraft, you know, these are vehicles that the majority of people will not buy. They will effectively have a ride-sharing ticket. Um, and so, getting the utilization of the vehicle is really important to bringing those costs down. So it's going to be a VA1X sharing system, right? Except I'm flaring, sharing a flying ride with my fellow passengers. Yeah, I think for us, we see lots of different models. So this is, again, perhaps where we distinguish ourselves against some of the competitors. We're not trying to fully vertically integrate. So in terms of the vehicle itself, we're partnering with, you know, really... Uh, experienced uh, partners. If you take Honeywell, they've been certifying flight control systems for 100 years. And that's what gives us the confidence that we can meet those certification timescales and the safety. 
But similarly, on the customer side, I think that the right strategy for us is very much one of collaboration. So in many cases, we will sell uh, our vehicles and we're wrapped around the, and aftermarket services around that, um, particularly around the battery management. Um, so, you know, an obvious use case will be airport city centers or airports into other areas, and therefore we would sell vehicles. I think in some areas where there is no existing um, uh, sort of air, air service that we can connect to, we may well operate our own ride hailing service, but we're really open to lots of different collaborations and approaches. What will it take for that to happen? You know, not just going from airport to the city, but maybe people flying around from city to city as well. Who are you speaking to uh, to make that happen? Um, so, so I think firstly, we see the, the biggest ultimate market being that intra-urban, so flying around within a city. Um, and that's driven really by a mega trend around more and more people living in cities. Um, and today, of course, we've got an amazing ability for those cities to grow upwards um, with reinforced concrete, with safety elevators and so on. But the reality is today everyone comes from the top floor down to the ground floor and then tries to travel across the city on the ground floor and then goes back up. And we all know that that's just causing huge levels of congestion. So that mega trend, I think, is going to drive in for uh, um, air taxi services as the biggest value proposition. But actually, we see that taking quite a while to happen. It's going to require a combination of additional infrastructure. So if we're going to have multiple um, landing ports within cities, not all of that is there today. Mm -hmm. There are real advances needed in terms of air traffic management. So today's air traffic management, the pilot talks to an air traffic controller. Mm -hmm. It's not capable of coping with, you know, hundreds or even a thousand vehicles flying over a city at any one time. And then there's a really important thing around public um, acceptance and public perception. And of course, different cities are going to have different rates of adoption, different public acception, um, you know, different uh, regulators and city mayors and the like are going to be in some cases more or less open. But we see all of that taking time. So for us, the nearer term opportunities particularly will be airport city centre where we're just doing a shuttle service, constantly going back and forth. Mm -hmm. Or in many cases, there are lots of examples where you have airports and there are other cities that are maybe within 100 miles. So rather than having to land, get in a taxi, you now get direct to your destination. Uh, or other many cities globally. I mean, if you look in Europe, I think there are 260 cities that are within 100 miles with a population of over 300,000 people. And today, many of those cities are very poorly connected by ground infrastructure. You know, there's maybe a, a river or a little mountain range or something in the way that means it takes a long time to get there. So we see those sort of intercity uh, and, and airport city centre probably being the bigger markets until the early 2030s when the intra-urban will really start to take off. So I suppose in the next perhaps 10 years, we're going to look forward to more of your point-to-point -point commuting within mm -hmm. densely packed cities like uh, or areas like Europe or maybe even connecting the islands of Indonesia and the Philippines, for example? Yes, I think there's clear use cases for Singapore. And actually, for me, having been Singapore a number of times, probably many of the higher value use cases for Singapore will be cross-border. Um, so I think that's an exciting opportunity that we're certainly keen to explore. Well, that's true, especially now that our high-speed railway is off the charts. That uh, creates another opportunity for VA1X. <laughs> <laughs> to take over that space. Now, let uh, I do have another question uh, for you, which is, you touched on this earlier. Besides partnering key heavyweights like Honeywell, how else is vertical aerospace distinguishing itself? You did say there was a bit of a, a space or a competition to be first. What makes you different? So, so I think the first thing is that there's, with good reason, a lot of excitement about this. Um, there are a lot of companies globally trying to develop these kind of vehicles. Uh, actually, only, I think, 12 have flown full-scale prototypes. Only about seven have flown multiple full-scale prototypes, of which we are one. Um, so the first thing to look at is uh, actually how far have these companies gone in that development world. Um, and, and, and the interesting thing about these vehicles, electrification opens up a lot more design options. So we're, we're fundamentally trying to design a vehicle that is a jack of all trades. It can take off and land vertically. It can transition to a really efficient forward flight. And so we're seeing really a bit like the early 1900s of aviation, lots of different concepts coming around. 
And there isn't some textbook you can pick up that tells you how to design one of these settings. So we found that having an agility and a learning by doing, whether it's high performance computing simulations all the way through to full scale prototypes is really, really key. I think one of the other differences, and this is probably the biggest distinguishing thing for us, is we very much started from the biggest hurdle to these vehicles being successful is going to be the safety challenges and the regulation. And so we've gone extremely deep in hiring amazing talent with deep expertise in certifying aerospace products. So very deliberately, our headquarters are based in Bristol in the UK. Bristol is one of the world's clusters for aviation. There are, in fact, 270 aerospace companies in and around Bristol. And uh, in total, I think we've got about 1,200 man years of aerospace and F1 experience, but most of that is aerospace experience. And across our team, you know, we're chairing some of the working groups defining the regulations for Europe. We've got people who've, uh, you know, formally been certifying lots of different aircraft types. So uh, it's one thing to build a prototype. It's quite another to have the knowledge to know how to make that into a safe and certifiable and for us, I think that's where we've got a real edge in terms of the skills, both in the company and with the partners that we have. Definitely. I think five years of tackling the bull by its horns, really looking at safety, regulation, lining up the right partners, that's not something that's easily surmountable. So I no. do very much wish uh, you continuing that uh, edge, and many of us are rooting to see VA1X here in Singapore, in fact. Now, Christopher has a question. You spoke about redundancies earlier. Have you tested those redundancies you talked about in live situations? Yeah, so, so in fact, a good example of this will be the second prototype that we flew, uh, must be about 18 months ago now. Um, so that was a 12 rotor configuration. Um, we did a number of subscale tests where we deliberately on those subscale tests turned the motor off to demonstrate that we could continue safe flight. And then, in fact, we did that in the full scale vehicle. So um, these are pretty substantial vehicles. In, in that case, uh, it was capable of carrying about um, 250 kilograms of payload. It demonstrated over 1.4 tons of thrust, so not a small scale vehicle. Um, but we flew it under Civil Aviation Authority permit to fly, and we did indeed do a demonstration of the motor out. Um, the other thing I would say we're doing at the moment, we've got Atkins helping us with all that functional safety architecture. And we've got all sorts of rig tests, you know, simulations of all of the pilot in the loop behaviors, um, all of the avionics and flight controls, where actually every day we're running thousands of cases to prove that the electronics, the brains in these vehicles, um, can respond to different hardware failures. Lovely. So I, I suppose, essentially, you more than outdid yourself in this large-scale testing 18 months ago, and I'm sure you've improved upon since. Well, I had a follow-up question from Robin. He says, Michael, great news for your work in the Bristol area and bringing the team together. Have you started working with the regulators? And if so, are there major issues they have said you have to overcome before they give you the go-ahead? So, in fact, we started working with the regulators in about 2018. Um, and as I mentioned, so, so Europe basically has set up an overall framework called SCVTOL or Special Condition VTOL that defines the overall safety levels. But then in the industry, we have to demonstrate um, that we can meet them. So, so what that means in regulatory speak is what is the acceptable means of compliance? So how do I prove I've hit that one times 10 to the minus nine safety level we've got used to on commercial airliners? Um, we've been heavily involved in shaping those regulations. We lead uh, one of the groups on electrical. And in fact, we're involved in four other working groups. I would say a year or two ago, there was quite a bit of uncertainty around the regulations. And over the intervening year, actually, we've got real clarity about what's going to be required. So, so in terms of, of course, there's always risks in developing these kind of vehicles. I think we've got a really solid basis and a really good understanding of what the regulators are going to expect. There's, of course, plenty of hard work to do between now and 2024 to demonstrate all of that. But we've got I think a good clarity on that and very much we've designed our aircraft around those regulations so we don't see any fundamental showstoppers to enabling us to certify. So in short, you cleared that trial in 2018, I suppose a few more and you're set for 2024 to be the first EVTOL to be certified, hopefully. <laughs> Plenty of work to do. We don't take the challenge lightly, but I think we've got a great team, some great partners, and we're on an exciting journey. 
Lovely to hear, Michael. Thank you. We hope to fly with you into the future and to see your flying vehicle here in Singapore, maybe in 2025, if we're lucky. With thank that, you very much. Thank you so to. much, Michael, for your time today.